you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to rise today to address the motion brought by the Honourable Member for Nanaimo Cowichan. Uh, the motion, as we've heard, it calls for a broad based demand for action to make improvements to the economic outcomes of First Nations, Inuit, and Metis. And, Mr. Speaker, I want to speak to how our government has been doing exactly that in investing in First Nations education. Firstly, Mr. Speaker, as we say many times in this House, the economy is the number one priority. But we also know that education and the economy are not mutually exclusive concepts. You just simply cannot have one without the other. And Mr. Speaker, it's been stated on numerous occasions by both the Assembly of First Nations and our government that education is essential to improving the lives of Aboriginal people and, of course, creating economic opportunities on reserve. Mr. Speaker, we also know that a quality education is an essential building block to finding a good job. And finding a good job leads to economic growth, and that economic growth will lead to community self-sufficiency. However, we know that many Canadians living in remote and rural northern communities do not always have the education they need to find the work. That's why ensuring First Nations have access to good education and improving the graduation rates for First Nation children is important. It's one of our top priorities. We want to ensure that Aboriginal youth are able to acquire the new skills and knowledge to enter into the labour market to contribute to a strong Canadian economy. Because, Mr. Speaker, it's not just the Canadian economy, it is, of course, the economy of our First Nations. We all participate in the same economy. Our government recognizes that education is crucial to unlocking the potential of First Nations youth and to supporting the growth of prosperous and self-sufficient First Nation communities. That's why we're committed to working together with willing partners to ensure that First Nation students have the best possible education and all of the opportunities that, of course, go with that. Mr. Speaker, today I'm going to outline some of the progress the government has made over the years. The story will show that we are committed now and into the future to work with willing partners to improve the educational system and the graduation rates for First Nation students. First Nation children need to be equipped with a quality education that can help them reach their full potential to take advantage of the great economic opportunities that this country has to offer. That's why every year, Mr. Speaker, our government invests approximately $1.5 billion to support roughly 117,000 elementary and secondary students living on reserve across the country. In addition, we allocate over $200 million each year to maintain and improve school infrastructure in First Nations communities. Our government is also working to improve the programs and structures that will provide the opportunity for First Nations students to acquire the skills they need to take full advantage of Canada's economic opportunities. For example, under Economic Action Plan 2012, our government committed to investing an additional, this is an additional, $275 million over three years to improve school infrastructure and education outcomes of First Nations students. These additional funds will ensure that more First Nations students get the education they need so that they can pursue the same opportunities available to all Canadian students. And Mr. Speaker, sadly, as we see time and time again, the NDP votes against these investments, including the member that has brought forward this motion today. Of the additional $275 million, $175 million will go to renovating schools on reserves and providing First Nation students with a better learning environment. $100 million will be allocated to support early literacy programs, services and partnerships with provincial school systems. Again, by voting against these investments, which we see time and time again, the opposition is just not supportive of improving the educational opportunities of First Nations. Mr. Speaker, these new investments will help ensure that the First Nation education systems on reserve are prepared for the implementation of a new First Nations Education Act. 
This proposed act would establish structures and standards to support strong and accountable education systems on reserve. Through intense consultations, we have committed to work with willing partners to have this legislation in place by no later than September of 2014. That's great. Mr. Speaker, First Nation students are the only children in Canada whose education system is not governed by any legislation. Our government, unlike previous governments, is committed to working to bring forward such legislation. This legislation would provide a modern framework necessary to build standards and structures, strengthen governance and accountability, and provide a mechanism for stable, predictable, and sustainable funding, which of course are key ingredients to educational success. Our government is committed to working with First Nations to develop a First Nations Education Act, and we are consulting with First Nations leaders, educators, parents, students, and other interested stakeholders. And Mr. Speaker, we are determined to follow through on this commitment. The first consultation took place in Halifax on January 22nd and provided participants with an opportunity to share their views on First Nation education reform and the proposed approach to the development of a First Nations Education Act. These intense consultations will include additional methods for interested individuals to provide us with their perspectives and feedback online through the departmental website. Intensive consultation with First Nation parents, students, leaders and educators as well as the provinces are integral to the development of this and the development and drafting of this legislation. Mr. Speaker, I must clarify that no legislation has actually been drafted. The purpose of these ongoing consultations is to get views and feedback so the legislation can be drafted. The input gathered during consultations will help shape the drafting of proposed education legislation. Once drafted, the proposed legislation will be shared with every single First Nation community across Canada, as well as with provincial governments and other stakeholders so we can get their valuable feedback. Furthermore, I must clarify that a First, Nation, First Nations Education Act will not override Aboriginal rights or treaties. The proposed approach will not apply to self-governing First Nations that have adopted laws related to education. We all need to continue working together to create the structures and standards that support strong, accountable education systems on reserve that ultimately contribute to the success of individuals and students and their communities. This is about more, this is about putting more choice in the hands of First Nations and clearly defining and formalizing the roles and responsibilities that are needed to build a strong, accountable education system. Our government's efforts on education reform are not intended to create more bureaucracy or, be bur or burdensome reporting requirements. A modern framework for education would promote accountability and transparency and minimize red tape for First Nations schools and organizations. The overall objective is to give First Nations students the best chance of success in order for them to graduate, obtain jobs, contribute to their communities and of course contribute to the Canadian economy. Our government recognizes that a sound piece of legislation will only be achieved with proper consultations and that's why we must work together. The rising importance of education is reflected in the new demands of a global economy that is more integrated and interconnected than ever. And education is essential to helping First Nations students, a First Nations student, realize his or her potential. Our government has also supported First Nation education through committed partnerships that have led to tripartite education agreements across the country. To date, seven tripartite agreements have been entered into in 2008, in addition to pre-existing tripartite partnerships in both British Columbia and Nova Scotia. These partnerships have helped strengthen education programs and services and standards between on-reserve and provincial education systems so students can transfer between the two systems without any academic penalty. For example, last January, our government, along with the BC government and the First Nation Education Steering Committee, signed the, the Tripartite Framework Agreement. The agreement aims to provide BC First Nation students 
with access to quality education programs, whether they live, whether they attend school on or off reserve. Under this agreement, the First Nations Education Steering Committee support, supports the delivery of quality education programs and services, meeting standards that will allow First Nations students to transfer without academic penalty at similar, level, similar levels of achievement between First Nations schools and provincial public schools. And in Nova Scotia, the 11 First Nations bands have signed on to the final agreement with respect to Mi'kmaq education in Nova Scotia. That agreement states that participating communities shall, and I quote, provide primary, elementary, and secondary education programs and services comparable to those provided by other education systems in Canada so as to permit the transfer of students between education systems without academic penalty. Mr. Speaker, this is a great leap forward for First Nations students. Educations like, education agreements like these are an example of the progress being made in education through dedicated partnerships. Partnerships that we want to replicate, replicate and emulate with legislation. We expect more tripartite agreements like the ones currently in place to come soon. Tripartite framework agreements are focused on putting the building blocks in place to strengthen First Nations schools. Mr. Speaker, our progress in education in recent years builds on numerous reports, including the Senate Standing Committee on Aboriginal Peoples, as well as the work stemming from the National Panel on First Nation Elementary and Secondary Education. In June of 2010, the Government of Canada and the Assembly of First Nations launched this independent National Panel on First Nation Elementary and Secondary Education. The National Panel consulted with First Nations leaders, parents, elders, students, teachers, provincial officials and the private sector across the country. In February of 2012, the National Panel released its final report, characterizing the current situation as a non-system that has failed First Nations. We know we must work hand in hand with First Nations communities to address these challenges. There's simply no other way. Mr. Speaker, just as important as education itself is the building where the learning takes place. Improving learning environments facilitate better educational experiences for First Nations students. Since 2006, the government has provided funding for over 260 school projects, including 36 brand new schools and 30 major school renovations or additions. Mr. Speaker, as I have mentioned, our government vests over 200 million annually on school infrastructure and in Economic Action Plan 2012, our government committed an additional 100 million towards schools on reserve. Through a new Strong Schools Successful Students Initiative, <coughs> this funding will help to strengthen the ability of regional First Nations organizations to provide students with education supports and services, including tripartite partnerships like the ones I have just discussed. First Nation schools and educational organizations will, of course, benefit from this. These funds will also support programs to improve the school management capacity, initiatives to strengthen relationships with provincial school systems, and early literacy programming and other supports and services for First Nation students in grades K to 12. The Strong Schools Successful Student Initiative provides new funding for new activities that support capacity development in areas such as governance and leadership, parental and community involvement, planning, performance measurement, risk management, and organizational planning. This, initi this initiative and investment is just one more way our government is working to place a good education within the grasp of all First Nations students. Mr. Speaker, we believe a good education opens the door to opportunities, to jobs, and of course to personal success. With actions and investments I have outlined today, the government is working to improve access <coughs> to a good education and graduation rates for First Nations students. Structural reforms will make this happen, partnerships will make this happen, and our government is taking the necessary steps to bring a 21st century education system to our First Nation children, and I urge the opposition to support us in these efforts. Mr. Speaker, the stakes are simply too high for us not to make First Nations education a priority. Improving the educational outcomes of First Nations children will be a key element in overcoming 
the socioeconomic challenges that face many First Nation communities. Improving the educational outcomes of First Nation children will also help strengthen our country's prosperity. As our First Nations are more successful, the Canadian economy will be more successful. I'm confident that all honourable members <coughs> must agree with me. The future success of First Nations in Canada will be intrinsically linked to the graduation rates of its members. That's why education on First Nations is such a priority. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Uh, questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Western Arctic. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague here on our side of the House for his for his comments on this on our bill. I, I appreciate that he talks a lot about education because education, of course, is very important. And but I'm I'm a little troubled by the figures that he's given us in terms of the government investment over here. Uh, I come from the Northwest Territories, where we handle capital investment in schools for for about 33 communities, many of them small, isolated communities. The cost of construction and maintenance of these schools is far exceeds somewhere in downtown Mississauga or, or in, uh, in Brampton, Ontario. This is not, we're not talking the same thing. So an investment of $275 million over this many years, when you have 600 reserves, where the situation with the building stock was dire when this government came in, is simply not adequate. We built a school in Inuvik. Uh, now, that's a little larger community, but the, the cost of that school was $120 million to build a proper school that is going to last for a significant length of time. So when we talk about $275 million over a number of years, you're going to do renovations, some capital, some new schools. You're not talking about a lot of schools for 600 reserves. So I, I, I'd ask my honourable colleague, if, if you were really interested in getting the support of us for these types of efforts, I think you'd have to increase that by an exponential factor, the investment over five years in, in First Nation Reserve schools. The Honourable Member for Brampton West. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I don't think my friend listened to everything I had to say. Of course, it's not just $275 million. That's $275 million in additional funds that we're going to be investing. As I said in my speech, we invest $1.5 billion annually plus $200 million per annually for maintenance. And this is an additional $275 million over three years. We're providing the kind of funding that's going to be necessary in order for First Nations communities to build the schools as quickly as possible. So my friends off, it's not $275 million, it's an additional $275 million over three years. Uh, questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, it was only yesterday when the leader of the Liberal Party asked the, the Prime Minister the question related to uh, graduations. Uh, and we want to be able to see more uh, individuals graduating and that's, you know, education e equates to, to opportunities and now under this government's policy it will take 20 years before, and that's if things are successful, 20 years before they'll hit the, the average Canadian graduation uh, rates. So this, the government needs to, to do a lot more on the education front. But my question to the member is, um, there is a difference between the, the Paul Martin uh, government and, and dealing with our uh, First Nations community versus his government. We believe in a, a comprehensive approach based on consultations. The Kelowna Accords is just an example of that, where 18 months of roundtable discussions from all different types of stakeholders, which led to a comprehensive agreement. My question to the member is, why does the current government, government not see the benefit for all Canadians in developing and supporting a comprehensive agreement and bring the stakeholders to the table that would ensure that there's a long-term vision for our First Nations in which they can lead and get behind. Great Thank you. <clears throat> the Honourable Member for Brampton West. Well, Mr. Speaker, as is always interesting with the members from the Liberal Party, somehow they have the answer to all the problems that they couldn't solve in 13 years straight when they were in government, but not only that, in the 75 of the previous 100 years when they were the government of this country. 
They weren't able to solve any of these problems, but now they have all the answers. Well, Mr. Speaker, if my honourable colleague had listened to my speech, I set out an extensive consultation process with respect to First Nations Education Act, and that's exactly the thing we need to move forward on education, and we're going to move forward with that. We're going to solve some of these problems. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? The honourable member for Langley. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the opposition have just said that they're not going to support any of our priorities. Uh, they're going to hold that political stand, not doing the right thing, but they're going to be political. Well, Mr. Speaker, the, our government has said that water legislation is our priority. We've said that time and time again. If they would support it, if the opposition members would, would support it, we actually could pass it very quickly. So. Uh, ask the Honourable Member if he could comment on the importance of water legislation. The Honourable Member for Brampton West. I want to thank my colleague for his question. Of course, this government, unlike the previous government, and we can talk about that track record for the remaining probably seven or eight minutes of my question and answer, but I can tell you we undertook the most extensive uh, review of water and wastewater systems across this country. Again, something that wasn't done by a government, uh, a party that was the government for 75 of the last 100 years. And we've prioritized which wastewater and drinking water systems are most at risk so we can move quickly to try and fix those. The legislation my colleague is talking about is an important step in that direction. And I would encourage members in this House, including the member uh, across the way, to support that legislation so we can keep moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, questions and comments? The Honourable Member for York Southwestern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I listened with interest to my uh, friend's comments about education. And uh, while it is uh, nice that the Conservatives are talking about education, I was wondering if he could tell us whether or not in the upcoming budget the 427 students who cannot go to post-secondary post school because there is no money, because there is no money in the budget, but they are waiting, they are sitting there, and apparently there are close to 10,000 such students across the country, whether there will be money in the next budget to correct this wrong. The Honourable Member for Brampton West. Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't know where my friend, uh, where he gets all of his numbers. What I can tell you is this. Uh, this gives me a great opportunity to tell you about what we have done. And this bears repeating. Built over 30 schools. This is since 2006. Built over 30 new schools. Renovated over 200 schools. Built over 10,000 homes and renovated thousands more. Increased funding for child and family services by 25%. That's just to name a few things. We're making the kinds of investments that need to be made to improve the educational outcomes of first age students. And if my friend was so concerned about that, why didn't he support our last budget where we had all kinds of investments for first age students? Why did he vote against that? Uh, questions and comments? L'honorable député de Terrebonne Blainville. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Sincèrement, je suis vraiment émerveillée par la capacité de ce gouvernement de se fermer les yeux face à un problème qui est persistant et un, pro un problème très majeur. On a eu une manifestation, on a eu ma uh, Theresa Spence qui n'a pas mangé, qui a fait la grève de la faim pour soulever à quel point il y a de l'inaction de ce côté du gouvernement. Par contre, ils ne se gênent pas. Ils se lèvent debout dans cette chambre et ils disent « Oh bien, on a fait telle chose, telle chose ». Est-ce qu'ils peuvent honnêtement dire, se tenir debout dans cette chambre, puis dire qu'il n'y a pas de problème, puis qu'ils sont en train de tout bien faire, parce que évidemment, les preuves disent autrement. The, the honourable member for Brampton West. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I, I certainly can't say that we're a perfect government. No government has been, and uh, he or she, she who is out with sin, without sin can cast the first stone. But what I can tell you is, we're working very hard to fix the problems in First Nations communities. We recognize that there is more to be done, but we've done an incredible job. And I've said this before, we have had more accomplishments with, uh, with meeting benchmarks with First Nation communities than any previous government. I mean, I can say it again, the list goes on and on. Over 30 schools, it's since two, that's since 2006. Renovated 200 schools. We have the best track record of any government in investing in our First Nation communities, and we are proud of that. Uh, questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Northumberland, Coney West. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I listened to my caucus mate intently when he was, when he was uh, talking about uh, some of the achievements of this government and First Nations, and I'm glad that he recognized that no government is perfect. Uh, no person in this room is perfect. But I think 
crossing party lines. We all want the best outcomes for our First Nations brothers and sisters across this country. And I think the honourable member also mentioned some of the some of the statistics, some of the some of the progress that we've made uh, that we've made. And I did listen previously to uh, the minister uh, when he said we you know we just didn't invest hundreds of millions, we invested billions in in, in fresh water. So I wonder if the member could could expound a little bit further on some of the accomplishments and and some of the challenges that we are prepared to face in the future. The honourable member for Brampton West, a short answer, please. It's a short answer to an open-ended question. Uh, you know, we've done lots, and I can tell you, as a member of the Aboriginal Affairs Community, one of the things that we're talking about is uh, land use development to unleash the economic potential on First Nation reserves. Things like changing land designations, like we just saw, making it easier for First Nations communities to be able to uh, designate land so they can lease and generate economic activity. Uh, improvements to the First Nations land management regime so more First Nations can get out of the land use sections of the Indian Act to spur economic activity. I could go on and on, but I have unfortunately only have a short answer. But let me tell you, we are doing lots and we're going to keep doing more. Resuming.